This video is a companion to the first part of Chapter 9 in Hoberman's um, Data Modeling Made Simple, and uh, the chapter is entitled, What are Logical Data Models? I'm uh, Professor James Renault from Shawnee State University, and I'll be taking you through this uh, video presentation. So logical data models start with the subject area model, and we add the details. We add the details to figure out exactly how something works and to figure out exactly what the business needs monitored. Now, remember when we're looking at, at the logical area model, when we're looking at, at, the, at the logical data model, we, we need to, for instance, if a business says we would like the total sales for the day, that's a great, that's a great thing but we're probably going to be saving the detail sales for each transaction with the date on it and then using that to roll all up into the details for the day. So think about all of the things that the business is saying they need and think about the individual data points and all the detailed data points that are going to be needed to generate those dynamically. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a subject area model and we're going to add some details. So let's start by looking at an example. Well, before we look at an example, um, the steps are to one, add the attributes to the entities of the SAM. So you've got the SAM, you understand the subject area model, add all the attributes you can come up with. We talked about keys, add the keys to the subject area model. In the subject area model, you're going to have many-to-many -many relationships of this is related to this many times and this is related to this many times. We have to eliminate those many-to-many -many relationships by putting a new table in the middle, by, by putting a new table or multiple tables between the two many-to-many -many relationships. And then we need to go through and really normalize and create a, a complete understanding of the data. And we'll do that after we learn a little bit of SQL. We're going to come back and, and normalize data. So, example one. We've got a, a subject area model that contained a customer, has many orders, an order belongs to one customer. We had an order, has many items on it, and an item can be on many orders. So we've put our attributes on our order table with order number, date, and customer, and we've defined the order number as the primary key. On the item table, we've got an item number or item ID that's the primary key with a description and a price and all of that. On our customer table, we have our, our customer ID as the primary key, and we then have their name and all of that. So we've done all of that so far. Now, notice also that we've put the customer ID as a foreign key on the order table, because if you remember when we talked about foreign keys in the previous presentation, that we use the foreign key to implement the one-to-many relationship by putting the primary key of the one table as a foreign key on the many table. So you can see that there we take the primary key of the customer table, customer ID, and put it as a foreign key on the order table. And so now we can look at an order and see what customer number that order belongs to. We can have a thousand orders, a million orders, and we can always look at the order and see what customer it belonged to. And then we can jump down to the customer table to get the customer's name, zip code, and, and email, and all of those other kinds of things. But look at the item ID relationship. How are we going to put, if we put an item ID on the order, then the order, the item can only be on one order, or the order can only have one item. Um, yeah, if we put the item ID on the order, the order can only have one item. If we put the order ID on the item, then the item can only exist on one order. Well, that's not going to work because we need that to be a many-to-many -many relationship. Let's see how we solve that. So the table I just added in the middle is here in blue to stand out. It's, it's the table in the middle. So I take the primary key 
a notice that now this order item table that I've added, the order has many order items, but an order item belongs to only one order. So an order would have multiple items listed in the order item table, and an item has many order items, so an item can be on many orders, but an order item belongs to only one item. So we can see that, that we've eliminated the many-to-many -many relationships by turning it into a table in the middle. Um, we've taken the primary key of the item table, and it's now the foreign key on the order item table. We've taken the primary key of the order table and made it a foreign key on the order item table. So we've now got those two foreign keys, and I've concatenated those two keys together to become the primary key, because the order item table would be unique. Order item would be a unique combination that can point to the order quantity of each item. So by putting that table in the middle, we've now created a logical structure that will work, including all of the keys, the primary keys, the foreign keys, the attributes, and we can see that we can start to, to maybe actually implement this in a database and start to, to use it to pull out the questions that we would have. Let's look at a second example here, and this is the relationship between a course and a student. Now, a course at a university would be like the, this course, BUIS 2400. But remember that the course BUIS 2400 could be offered on several terms and several times a term. So a course and a class aren't the same thing. A so, But let's look at the relationship. A student can take many courses, and a course can belong to many students. The primary key of the course table is department code course number, like B BUIS and 2400, or BUIS 1010, or STAT 1100, or whatever. Um, and the student ID number would be the primary key of the student table. If we put the student number on the course table, then a course could have one student forever, never a second student. And if we put the department code and course number on the student, then a student could take one course and not all the courses they, they need to take to get a degree. So we need to eliminate this many-to-many -many relationship. So to eliminate this many-to-many -many relationship, um, I've decided, well, I need the class table because a course can have many classes. Um, we can have multiple classes in a semester. We can have multiple courses. We can offer that course in multiple sections. We can offer it in multiple terms. We can offer it for multiple professors. So I've created a class table, and I've got a department code, course code, which is the foreign key over to the course table, and then I've got year, term, and section so that we can now offer that course this semester, next semester, three years from now, four years ago, we could offer multiple sections, section one, section two, section three, section 90, whatever, um, in the same semester for some courses that are really popular. So a course has many classes and a class belongs to only one course. But the relationship between students and classes now is still many to many because the student can take many classes over their time at the university, and a class belongs to many students. But we're getting closer. We're getting closer to the point that we can eliminate that many-to-many -many relationship. I also threw in the department table just to get the foreign key of department code to a description of the, of the program or department. Um, so let's now get rid of this many-to-many -many relationship with a second table in the middle. So what I did was I created this table here called the register table. So a student registers for many classes, and a class has many student registrations. Look at this primary key, though. The primary key is department code, course number, year, term, section, and student ID number. What a nasty primary key. And the department code is a foreign key. The department course year term section would be a foreign key. 
over to the class table. The department course would be a foreign key over to the course table. And, and I didn't even mark all the foreign keys there like I should have. Um, so this is a nightmarish example of, of eliminating the many to many's, but we've gotten rid of the many to many relationships now that a student registers for many courses. A course has many students register for the course. And, and we can now say that we've eliminated the many-to-many -many relationships. Where would the student's grade be saved? I believe it would be saved in the register table as an attribute because um, a student could register for a class once, fail it, and then register again for another class with the same course code and pass it. So that would add, the grade would be associated here with the, with the register table. So that sounds like uh, sounds like a solution that probably is going to work. We could simplify it by using a surrogate key on the class table. For instance, you see up at the top, I've created a, a surrogate key called class number, and just said, "Well, you know, the class number that's that's good enough. Um, that's fine." Oh, and uh, it should say that the course number is also a foreign key on the on the class table. But now that we have a class number, this would be class number, you know, each class would be assigned a unique number. Every time the university offers a new class, we would just give it a surrogate number, a surrogate key, a, a new number. Um, department code course, year term, section professor, all works just great. We could then have the surrogate key on the register table. So the register table would contain class number and student number and the possible grade or some other attributes. And we still have the many to many eliminated, but our big nasty concatenated primary key that would be a nightmare to work with has now been simplified by using the surrogate key. One other thing that I need to mention in this video is that when we're dealing with supertypes and subtypes, for instance, um, our university example, I have a supertype called people. So every person is in the people table, and peoples can be students, professors, or staff. Um, and a, could a staff be a student and a, and a staff member? Could a professor take a class? Um, so the answer would be yes to all of those. So I would say that's a non-exclusive subtype. So the student, a, a professor could also take a class as a student. A staff member could also take a class as a student. So you can see that that the way we uh, the way we turn that into a logical model is that we take the primary key of the supertype and use it as the primary key on the subtype. I didn't draw the professor or or uh, faculty or staff uh, boxes, but I, I could have. Um, but you can see that on the people table, I have a people ID. So each person would be assigned uh, a number or some kind of ID, primary key to each of the people in the people table. And the attributes of the people table would contain name, birthday, social security number, and all of those common values that are across all different types of people. And then you can see on the student people, the student table, we would have the people ID that would link up to the people table to get the people information. So we would use the people ID as the primary key and the foreign key on the student as well as the faculty member as well as the as the staff member. So when we're dealing with a subtype supertype, the supertype's primary key is also the subtype's primary key and also happens to be a foreign key. This concludes my brief introduction to the first half of chapter nine. And I'd like to thank you for watching. Remember, this video is copyright 2020 by James Imbrano, PhD. All rights are reserved.